Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and we're back with another of our 5 Minute Histories videos and today I'm downtown in front of Camden Yards or more correctly, Oriole Park at Camden Yards, a negotiated settlement of a name, but we'll get to that. And if you're following along more or less real time, you know that we are on the eve of opening day 2024 um, and pretty soon down here there will be a sea of orange excitement. There's already a lot going on um, and we thought we would uh, help build that excitement with a video of our own, not so much focusing on baseball things like earned run averages, but on how we got a Oriole Park at Camden Yards to begin with. Um, in 1992, April of 1992, when the ballpark opened, it broke ground instantly and in a lot of ways is still a trendsetter for ballparks across the country. I'd like to start with a quick thanks to a gentleman named Bill Statler, who a few years ago wrote a wonderful article on the history of Camden Yards. We're going to start our story, though, not in 1992, but in 1980. And I can almost hear you football fans groaning out there because you know what's coming. That's when the Baltimore Colts snuck out of town to Indianapolis. And we were fearful that the owner of the Orioles, a gentleman named Edward Bennett Williams, would do the same thing. Uh, take the Orioles maybe down to D.C. The Orioles and the Colts shared a stadium at the time, Memorial Stadium. And one of the issues on the table was whether uh, the Orioles would get a new stadium of their own. In 1987, the state agreed to uh, uh, partially fund and build a new stadium. Um, so the big question was, where would it go? And there were a lot of strong voices back then. A number of folks wanted it to go to Port Covington in South Baltimore. There was a strong contingent for the state fairgrounds in Timonium. And there were a lot of people who thought it ought to go somewhere between Baltimore and Washington, maybe outside of Laurel or Columbia. The site here, the former railroad yards of the B&O Railroad, had a lot going for it. Maybe the biggest thing it had going for it was its chief backer, former Baltimore mayor and then Governor William Donald Schaefer. Schaefer thought that a new ballpark here would be good not just for baseball fans, but for the city as a whole. And he, of course, was right. So now that we had a, 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 a new site, the next big question was, what would it look like? And for that, we turned to designers, both local and nationally. Locally, the architectural giant RTKL designed the master plan, and then we looked to a firm out of Kansas City called HOK to design the stadium itself. HOK had designed a lot of ballparks over the years before ours, most recently Comiskey Park, and it looked kind of, well, like a lot of the ballparks designed in the 1960s and 70s, a lot of concrete surrounded by parking, and that's what the first vision was for this ballpark here. At, at the time, the state's historic preservation officer said that it looked to him like a giant concrete UFO landing in a sea of parking. Not so complimentary. But the city and the state and the Orioles leaders uh, had a different vision, and HOK was willing to bend. Um, they envisioned a ballpark that harkened back to the older parks like Fenway and Wrigley Field uh, that was asymmetrical to fit into the irregular street grid pattern of the neighborhoods that it was part of, and then maybe most of all, that was built uh, using that very Baltimore building material, bricks. Um, for this vision, they brought in a young and clearly talented architect named Janet Marie Smith. As a disclaimer, Janet Marie is a former Baltimore Heritage Board member, and I, like I think everybody, think that she's fantastic. So Janet Marie and her colleagues were brought in to help shape and then create this vision. The first big thing they did was help convince everybody to save the 1905 warehouse, the B&O Railroad warehouse that's uh, part of the site here. Um, the warehouse, incidentally, uh, was built for the B&O, which carried a lot of passengers, but a lot of freight. And at 1,116 feet long, it, I believe, is the longest building on the east coast of the United States. Um, so with saving that, and a lot of people thought it shouldn't be saved, they argued it should be demolished so that the ballpark would have a better view of the still new Inner Harbor. But with saving that, Janet Marie and her colleagues took a big step towards achieving a lot of the visions for the new ballpark. The new ballpark could be built of brick, playing off the historic brick that the warehouse is made of. It could be asymmetrical, fitting into the existing street pattern here, critically keeping Utah Street open with its connection to downtown, to the Hippodrome, to Lexington Market. And then, um, even on opening day in 1992, with this historic uh, railroad warehouse as part of an integral part of the ballpark itself, uh, instantly having historic grounding in Baltimore. 
So uh, that was a big step. Another big step was bringing in another local firm, Ashton Designs, to create the graphics and the signage, that classic 19th century clock that was above the scoreboard on opening day in 1992. As a somewhat aside, it's not surprising that the folks in Boston and uh, Los Angeles, when they were going about redesigning their ballparks, brought on Janet Marie Smith uh, to help them. And it's also maybe not surprising that Ashton Design was part of that uh, repackaging as well. So now we have a site and we have a ballpark design. The last big question was, what was the name going to be? And for that, there were two camps. One camp was William Donald Schaefer. He wanted the name Camden Yards, hearkening back to historic Baltimore. This other camp was the owner of the Orioles at the time, a, name, a gentleman named Eli Jacobs. Williams had passed away in between. Jacobs wanted to call it Oriole Park after his Orioles. And apparently at the very last minute before the big name announcement, they agreed on a, a settlement, a merger, if you will, calling it Oriole Park at Camden Yards. So in April of 1992, when Camden Yards uh, opened, uh, our team won, but maybe for this story, more importantly, our ballpark won. And let me read to you what the architectural critic for the New York Times, Paul Goldberger, uh, wrote about the new stadium. He said, this is a building capable of wiping out in a single gesture 50 years of wretched stadium designs and of re uh, restoring joyous possibility that a ballpark might actually enhance the experience of watching the game of baseball. That was the New York Times. Um, a few years later, the Baltimore Sun, in reflecting on uh, how the park had held up and influenced other parks, uh, the Baltimore Sun wrote, Baltimore's success at Oriole Park practically overnight caused America to rethink its view of stadiums as being more than just big bowls where athletes clash. And of course, uh, that was uh, correct as well. Since 1992, when Oriole Park opened, something like 20 or more stadiums have been built, and uh, many, maybe most, have taken cues from Oriole uh, Park. Uh, a lot of them, a lot of cues from Oriole Park. Think of the stadiums in Cleveland, in San Francisco, in Denver, and in Pittsburgh, all looking uh, a lot like elements of Camden Yards here, and all located downtown, now out in the suburbs, all hearkening back in that retro way to ballparks that made you feel good about being part of the uh, park of the experience. So I'm going to wrap up and say that on opening day 2024, uh, there is a lot to be excited for. Um, everybody is writing that the Orioles are going to be a good team this year, maybe a great team. And Camden Yards is continuing to be a great ballpark, uh, a trendsetter helping showcase the best of Baltimore. So I'm going to conclude uh, by saying one more final thing. Uh, and that is, let me see if I can unzip this. Uh, of course, go O's and go Camden Yards. Thanks so much. And we'll see you next time.